It was a time where David was very fearful of Saul. First Samuel, the 21st chapter in verse 10, we find that the word had gotten out that the saying was that Saul killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And one of the lowest places you can be is when jealousy fills your heart, as it did with Saul, and he played the fool. And he was out to get David. David was afraid where he was before the king of Gath. And what he did that day was he acted like a crazy man. He scribbled on the gates of the city. He drooled in his beard like a madman. And the king says, I don't need any madman in my presence. So he fled from that moment. He had that opportunity and he went and hid out in a cave as the drama in his life with Saul continues. It is that moment where David reflects upon in the 34th Psalm and he praises God, worships God and praises him for deliverance. I didn't read there where God delivered him miraculously. David played a madman and he was able to get out because the king didn't want a madman in his presence. Could God be behind the scenes doing that? David thinks so. David knows so. David realized that God is watching at all things and he writes this wonderful psalm. And it's interesting that from that psalm, Peter in his day would reflect upon it. There's two passages there that we need to taste and see that Jehovah is good. And in the third chapter, verses 10 through 12, we begin to realize if you desire good days and you love life and desire good days, these are some things you're going to do. We'll talk about those things tonight. But those two passages come from a time of deliverance. And God's people in Peter's time needed deliverance. They were going through persecution. Oh, they weren't dying yet for the cause but they were being persecuted for being a Christian. They were being isolated and done away with. And therefore, Peter is reflecting upon the sufferings and the tribulations that indeed God delivers us from. And it seemed like he knows twice he quotes from that particular book. Could that be having something to do with what his message was to his day of suffering? I haven't been put in jail yet for preaching the gospel. There were people in the New Testament that were, that preached the gospel. I haven't had my goods and my house confiscated by a government who doesn't care about Christianity. But we live in that time. Our young people live in a time where Christianity is not on a high trend. <laughs> There's more and more people being vocal about the hatred toward Christianity. And we live in that time of persecution. And whether you might not feel it, what we find here in Peter's epistles, in David's psalm, we find ourselves preparing. Maybe you're not suffering yet, but if you live godly, you will. And we're here to prepare you for that time. And it may surprise you what that preparation looks like. And I would like to unfold the 34th Psalm. I would like to see how that applies to Peter's day, understanding that applies to our day as we live in a very real time where Christianity is frowned upon, it's not praised, where God is being exercised out of our society. They would like it to be, him to be gone from any influence. And we stand for God, we stand for Christ, and we have to fight those battles. Well, we need to prepare ourselves for what that means as far as Christianity is concerned. It's interesting how Peter, because I think he does reflect on Psalm 34. He's guided by God to write, but this thing, these things have been connected. And I want you to notice how we just pick up on two things in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12 and 16. When he speaks about their persecution, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial upon you. 
I just never thought this would happen. I'm a Christian and living the right life. Why would anybody be upset with me? It happens. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial upon you, which cometh upon you to prove you. Don't you remember that? He's proving us, testing us, making us stronger as steel is tested and purified. It is a process that's taking place, and that's why God allows that to happen. But it's there to prove you, but don't think it's strange. And I think we think it's strange when we are persecuted for doing what's right. I think that so. well, I, I don't understand that. We might understand why, why people, they're in power, they don't like Christians. And they're now in power, they don't mind it being known. Don't think it's strange, brethren, when evil is able to have some power to do some tribulation in your life. Peter's preparing us for that, if we haven't experienced it yet. It had come upon them, and he was trying to Help them to understand what it would be. So what should it be like? Verse 16. But if a man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. That's the way the world would like you to feel. You're, you're no count. You're not a loving person. You're not inclusive enough. You have all of these things going against you because you serve God in Christ. Yeah, that's a good thing. Not anymore. But do not be ashamed but glorify God in this name. Do you do that? Do I do that when I'm suffering? Glorify God in his name. Where did Peter get that? He's inspired. But you'll see tonight, that's exactly what Psalm 34 teaches us. And I don't think we're prepared for that sometime. Give me a while to be in my pity party. Give me a little while to blame God. Give me a while to, to get in my room and be a recluse. I'm not going to church. I'm not going to try to glorify him and serve him. I'm having my day, and God's just going to have to be patient with me. When I think of that, I can see every reason why. You haven't been here before. You haven't experienced this. Yes, we'll give you some time, and, we, and, and you can just deal with this burden that you have. We're going to be gathering today to exalt Christ. And we're going to be worshiping him. Would you show up? No, I got, I got, you don't know what I'm going through. Probably not. But when you're suffering and when you're in tribulation, you'll see this evening that David opens up the 34th Psalm of praising God and said, won't everybody come and do it with me? Yeah, because he was delivered. Well, he didn't report about that deliverance. It's there in the beginning of the psalm telling you what inspired it. He was delivered on that occasion. But he's not reporting about that event. He's taking us a broader picture of how we can prepare ourselves for suffering. So let's look at this psalm in light of 1 Peter. And let's just see who is the one that is going to be glorifying God in suffering. Who is this person that is able to do that? And when I come to this psalm, I come to this psalm saying, well, I want to know what it means to fear God. I want, I want to know what it means to fear God. Because fearing God is one of the characteristics that describe the person that can glorify God in suffering. But when you take some time, you'll realize just who is the person that glorifies God. First of all, they're meek in verse 2. My soul shall make her boast in Jehovah. The meek shall hear therefore and be glad. The meek. What's caused them to be meek? Maybe the suffering where you're having to flee from one place to another to avoid persecution? And you're not real high and mighty about how I've got everything going my way. If the meek are going to do it. What about the poor man? In verse 6, the poor man cried and Jehovah heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Is this the same person that fears God? Yes. Because verse 7, the angel of Jehovah encampeth around about him that fear him and delivereth him. 
And when we're looking at that, see how much fear comes in? The reverence of God. Verse 9, O fear Jehovah, ye his what? His saints. Verse 9. For there's no want to them that fear him. God's going to provide. God is going to deliver. Who is this person? The young lions do lack and they suffer hunger. But I tell you what, but they that seek Jehovah shall now not want any good thing. I'm getting a broader look at this one who is indeed suffering. The one who desires life and loveth many days. And he, he says that he may see good. Tell him, well, that's the fellow we're talking about. Meek, poverty stricken, maybe poor in heart, is fearing God. And it's one in verse 11, we talk about fear of God. Come, you children, hearken to me, and I will teach you the fear of Jehovah. I will instruct you what it means to have the fear of Jehovah. That's why I come to this psalm sometime. But I look at the big picture and realize that here are the people of God and they're righteous in all of their doings. That's a highlight too in this psalm, not just those who fear God. Verse 15, the eyes of Jehovah are toward the righteous. Verse 17, the righteous cried and Jehovah heard. And verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of a righteous. Jehovah hears. Jehovah delivers. And if you live a righteous life, we talked about Job this morning. He was blameless and he was one that lived an upright, righteous life. And before men, you can, you can count on that man. He'll do the honorable thing. He will not cheat you. He'll go out of his way to serve you. He's following what? He's following the teachings of the Lord. He seeks the well-being of even his enemies. Why would you ever persecute him? Because he stand in the way of power who wants to serve themselves. And they want to submit to themselves either to God or to Jesus Christ. And they'll speak about you and they'll speak evil about you. What did Paul do to, re, to, to give strength to the Christians of his day? Acts 14 and verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples. They went back to their, these cities, these little places where the church was established. Exhorting them to continue in the faith that through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. Let me emphasize, you do not leave this earth as a Christian without suffering persecution. Some form, somehow, some way. Life is going to be very difficult somewhere along our life paths. And especially as a Christian, we must go through this if we're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The church in Thessalonica was newly formed. Their faith was new and therefore it could be very fragile. And afflictions could come upon them and and draw them away from the Lord. Listen to how Paul addresses that. That no man be moved by these afflictions. They're happening. For yourselves know that herein too we are appointed. We are appointed for tribulation. Who appointed that? God. And we don't see that because we live in a Christian America. We live in a Christian nation. And people love Christians. Do they right now? I don't think so. We need to prepare ourselves. Not everybody's going to like you. How will you react? Will you be prepared? Afflictions for causing for the cause of Christ, living life, is going to come. For verily when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we are to suffer affliction even as it came to pass as ye know. Paul's gone through it. He's preparing the Thessalonians to go through that. And you read that and you just read on because we, we want the glories of people being saved and people are going to like you. You're going to be a good husband. You're going to be a good wife. And you're going to be a good citizen. People are going to love you. If there's ever a time that you realize how those tables can be turned, at one time maybe young people, you were being a Christian, people would praise you and say, I wish you'd date my daughter or my son because there was honor given to that. 
People don't know their Bible. They don't know who God is. And to have to submit to something that they don't know. And they've never had any teaching about it. He, they, they're they're going to react differently to you. Are you prepared for that? Suffering is the plight of all people. And who's doing the suffering? These are pretty good people. <laughs> but they've been broken. In verse 18, back to our Psalms, they've been broken. Jehovah is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such of a contrite spirit. What could have made them to come maybe to repentance or maybe to come closer unto God? A lot of times persecution can do that. It can drive you away. But here's the godly person suffering. And you're humbled. Maybe the point of, I, here's where I've sinned, God. But there's someone that is meek. There's things that have happened that realize this is not what I planned for. But it's what I'm experiencing. And these are the people suffering before, before God. And we see it in verse, in verse 18. And then finally in verse 22, Jehovah redeemeth the soul of his servants, those dedicated unto him totally. And none of them that take refuge in him shall be condemned. Oh, people are being condemned for being righteous? Yes. People are being condemned for being a Christian? Yeah. People are being condemned for living that lifestyle? Are they perverting the scripture? And say, we're the people that don't love? Because we won't allow people to get by with killing babies without pushback, how bad that is? They're not called them murderers. That means you don't love. Things are being twisted. Try not to understand the context of the word. They're just out to put down Christians and to Persecute, isolate us, make us irrelevant. David says, God delivers these are the people. And you want to tell you who is the one that fears God? It's all of these. All of these. It's just so I think I'll go to this psalm and find out some verses that talk about fearing God. I start looking at that. I said, this is who suffers. This is the one who God delivers. And there's some positive things. I, I love life. I desire good things in life. But not all things are going to go my way. And I'm broken. I have a contrite heart. I am meek. Either poverty of spirit, I've all lost my possessions. I'm sanctified by, from the world of sin. But that world of sin has the power to do a lot of damage to me. And we may be going through all types of suffering. That doesn't mean necessarily our death. But here's the point. These are the people that can glorify God in suffering. And if you can't glorify God in suffering, you may not have experienced what caused these people to be humble. Or you may not really fear God and reverence God as you should. This is to prepare us. But it's one who says, we'll meet with you. We're going to glorify God. That's what Peter is saying we do. Don't be ashamed. Glorify God in his name. And we're coming together to exalt God in all of his deliverance from us, for us, and what we've gone through. What do the righteous do when they suffer? I think it's a good way to put it. This is a time of suffering. It is a, it's a glorifying God because he's delivered. So what do you do when you suffer? You pout? You blame? You become a recluse? You pull back all of your, your forceful do what's right? And you just mope and all of that? Well, there's sometimes we feel bad and feel discouraged. But this is to prepare us. What do the righteous? What are the people that fear God? What, what, do they, what do they do? Can you say Jehovah's good? <laughs> and as you take your refuge in God, that means there's serious times coming. Refuge in God. So I, need, I don't have anybody to turn to. My life is very difficult. And I'm suffering some type of persecution. 
Can you say that Jehovah is good? And before this sermon, well, by the time this sermon is over, you're going to be able to say that. Because you have a new outlook upon things. How God wants us to be. But taste that Jehovah is good. Is that the last thing that you would say in the times of your persecution? That Jehovah is good? Or is it just about you? I feel bad. I don't want to say anything about God. But can you say Jehovah is good? That's what Peter is telling to a people. As they put away the weeds in their spiritual garden, of jealousy and all of those things, and receive with meekness that implanted word, as James speaks about, that indeed they are longing for the sincere milk of the word. They put away those sins and they long for the sincere milk of the word and finding God to be gracious. Realizing he saved me. I'm not going to live a life of sin just because my life is stinks and why I've served God now because it's, uh, it's not real popular. No, God is good. And I need to anchor myself in that. He's that. He does that which is good for me. And I'm going to have to look through this dark time. And I'm going to have to just take my refuge in him. And all the way I'm singing inside the cave. Of his refuge. God is good. That may take some preparation on your part. So why not do it before they confiscate your goods or put you in jail or your friends speak evil of you because you're a Christian and that hurts your feelings what do the righteous do I tell you I might like to get even I might want to render evil as possible of what they're doing to me and that might be a, a temptation for you but that's not what you do here in Psalm 34 that's not what you do in 1 Peter 3 that's not what the righteous do that's glorifying God in a time of suffering. You do not render evil for evil. But what do you do? You control your tongue. Refrain your tongue from evil. I'm not going to do anything physically, but I am going to tear down them verbally. That's what they've done to me. Evil for evil? No. No, I'm prepared. That's, that's the last thing I'm going to do. I'll just keep my mouth shut. I'm going to turn away from evil. I'm not going to go to my God in prayer and wish bad things upon those people that have done me bad. And of course, God, you take care of it. Let your, let you, you, you give them what they need. I'll just turn it over to you. This is what I like to have happen. I, I'm going to not speak evil. I'm going to bless I'm going to even do good. I'm going to pursue peace. Can we have a conversation of why you're treating me this way? And all through it all, I realize God's watching. God sees. God sees it all. Are those the things that will go through your mind when you're tempted to do evil? I hope so, because <laughs> that's the context. And when you look at Psalm the 34th chapter, you see that those are exactly the things that are in David's mind as he praises God for his deliverance. The, verse 11, come you children, hearken unto me. And in verse 12, what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil. Thou lips from speaking guile or deceit, lying about somebody else because they did that to you. Depart from evil. Well, okay, I'm not doing evil. I'm, I'm controlling that. Are you doing good? I'd like to have peace, but I don't pursue it. No, look how active you are. See, you're, you're working to do what's right before God because you're a righteous person. And he's prepared you for these days. And you do good. You seek peace. And you pursue it. Like a hunting dog going after the prey. I'm on a trail. I'm pursuing Peace. 
And I know the eyes of Jehovah are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry, but the face of Jehovah is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them upon the earth. God will take care of the evil, but I'm not going to wish that upon them, God, because I'm going to do good to them. And I won't try to seek peace by living the life of a Christian that might wake them up and realize they should be ashamed of what they said about the good life of a Christian. I'm going to live that life regardless how long I've got to suffer. You see the mentality that's brewing in this psalm? That Peter takes it to the people of his day and we take it to our day? I don't have to fear those who harm me. I just need to fear God. It may seem strange to you that in 1 Peter, the third chapter, you've got these two fears that are coming together. And when you think about Psalm 34, which Peter may, at least he's reflected upon it. When you read what Peter said, you realize, hey, I think Psalm 34 was affecting what he said. And the times were there. In verses 13, who is he that will harm you? Well, I got a list. That's what they're doing to me. Who is he that will really harm you if ye be zealous for that which is good? That's the problem. But who really is harming you? See, you're getting ready to have a different mindset than you probably ever had. Because it's in my time, he's done me harm. Now, I can pick up what I need to do with him. Okay, I got that. But who is he that will harm you? This is to strengthen you for those times. If you be zealous of that which is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you mean that may happen? <laughs> I thought they couldn't do me any harm. They can't. When you understand how we're to react to suffering, they can't harm you. But even if you should suffer for righteous sake, Blessed are ye, and fear not their fear. Don't fear them who can harm you. Don't fear their fear. What do I do? But sanctify in your hearts Christ as Lord, being ready to always give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason concerning the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. What fear? Reverence for God. Don't fear their fear, those who can harm you, that can torture you before they kill you. That will probably torture you the way that they understand is your greatest fear. And they may put you through that test. I don't fear them. Because the mindset is said here that even what they do I will fear Jehovah, and maybe there'll be somebody that realizes this isn't right, and they wake up, and I may save a soul. God, give me that opportunity. You don't fear them to harm you. That is a place of freedom in your mind for whatever man could do to you. That's in Peter, those two fears, and that's in Psalm 34, too, which is preparing us for suffering. And here's something that is very important. Deliverance is not necessarily immediate. It's not necessarily immediate. Got three passages here. And notice how Peter reflects upon that, which I think is in Psalm 34 as well. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 6, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, for how long? A little while, if need be, you have been put to grief in manifold trials. Many types of trials and persecutions. They're there to prove you. We've got that in our minds. But it's for a little while. How short is little? <laughs> How long is little? He doesn't say. But you know when you're feeling persecution. And it's there tomorrow. It may be there the next day. But I realize it's not forever. <laughs> and I'll just wait on the Lord. Because I've got a lot of other things to do too. As I'm going through this. 
Look at 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Whose time? Mine? God's time. It, we sing a song, In His Time. In due time, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Down to verse 10. And the God of all grace who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. Notice, into eternal glory, your mindset is being kind of lifted up beyond this, this time on earth. To reflect upon something about God's grace who called you into his eternal glory in Christ. That after you've suffered for a little while. Shall himself perfect, establish, and strengthen you. God knows our life. He knows our limits. He knows what we can do. And sometimes he brings things upon us that says, I can do that. Never thought I could do that. Never thought I could withstand that. Never thought I could get through that. And all he's doing is making you stronger. Because he doesn't let you avoid tribulation and persecution in life. And sometimes that's old age. <laughs> because we live life and we live young times and we, we don't have any, any problems. We sit around and admire how the little ones can raise up their heels and, and they can turn their bodies real quickly. And we're sitting over there and say, wow, I really, can you do that? No. But you're young, you can. And you're old, you, you're limited. How long, God, do I have to go through this? just old age you may have to go through that till you die and the persecution you feel the tribulation you feel is real well God how come you made us this way we come and we born and it's time to be born there's a time to die God's been telling us all of our life but we don't see that until we have to experience it and this is prepare you young people for those events. It's to prepare middle-aged people. It's to prepare every one of us. Are we the people of God that really reverence God? Then we'll be the people that begin to have this mindset. It doesn't necessarily come immediately because I prayed to God. I'm doing good. And God, I can't hold on much more. Yeah, you can. Because you prepared your mind for this time of suffering. Psalm 34 takes us in a direction that you might not think, well, you can't really say that. <laughs> and I ask you, what's the nature of the deliverance? What's the nature of the deliverance here in Psalm 34? He doesn't mix any words about it. Here's David speaking about deliverance. Yes, he was delivered from the king of Gath. But all through here, I want you to notice how complete, how total. There's not anything he doesn't deliver you from. That's what he's saying. Well, let me read it, okay? Verse 30, verse 4. I sought Jehovah and he answered me. Well, yeah, David. And he delivered me from all my fears. I don't fear anybody that can harm me. That king can harm me. I don't fear him because I act like a crazy fellow. And I escape. He knew God. Had his angels around him. And was protecting and delivering him. And here's the point. Is he just, is, is hyperbole? <laughs> he delivers me from all my fears. He delivers me from all of my troubles. The poor man cried and Jehovah heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Not just some of them. All of them. Verse 17. The righteous cried and Jehovah heard and delivered them out of all of their troubles. He's not holding back. He doesn't change his view about the nature of this deliverance. You say, what about my fear of death? 
What about my troubles as I get older and I'm going to die? What about that? He delivers you from all of them. Really? Just how is he able to say that? And to the point that while that is all happening, there will be no want. In verse 9, O oh, oh fear Jehovah, all ye saints, for there's no want to them that fear him. You'll never want for anything. Yeah, I'd like to not have to take all this medicine. I'd like to not have all of these doctor's appointments. I'd like to have more money of retirement. Because it's kind of going down all the time with prices going up and all those things. This is troubled times. There's no want. That's the nature of this deliverance. Verse 10, the young lions do lack and so forth, but they seek that Jehovah, they shall no want any, they'll not want any good thing. God's going to deliver them. And they will have all the good things that they need. There's no want, there's no fear, no trouble, just in case you missed it. He will lift all, he'll deliver you from all afflictions. Really? My disease? The ultimate death? Yeah. But not the way you think. Not the way I think. Not the way we judge things. I'm no longer going to have that disease anymore. Thank God. I appreciate what he's done for me. But we'll still get sick and we'll die. How can that psalm be true? It can only be true because your view is not your life, your time. You're looking at life in the context of eternity. And we don't view it that way when we're hurting. We don't look at it that way. Well, about deliver me from my troubles. I'm waiting on the Lord. And when is it going to be? And we say the hardest thing to do is to wait on the Lord. That's true. But you know how you can wait on the Lord? Lord, I may have this for the next 10 years and I die the next day. And I'll still glorify God and he's good. That's the mindset. And that's the psalm that David wrote when he's delivered. Well, he was delivered from a king, and that's how we look at life. And Peter said that's the mindset of the people of his day that necessarily were going to die, but they could. And they're not to fear those who can harm them. It is the complete and total deliverance. And notice how... He helps us see that. No bones will be broken. That comes to the close. He keepeth all his bones, all his afflictions, all of his troubles. He keepeth all his bones and not one of them, not one of them is broken. An interesting phrase. One that's probably the hardest thing to try to understand. And dealing with reality. And dealing with how I want to look at my deliverance and my time frame. And maybe uh, we'll get, get it done in my middle age and my, my closing years will be, will be wonderful. And no difficulties and all that sort of thing. And realize that, no, those are going to be difficult times for you too. And, and God is help, helping you to get through that too. But he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. No one of them is broken. The Bible speaks about honoring people's bones. And I want us to see three things about caring about the bones. We probably don't care about the bones. Unless it's Halloween time and we want to scare somebody. We'll put up a rack of bones for somebody, scare them. That's a scary thing. But it's one that in the Bible, there's a great care about the bones. Remember Joshua. Here in Joshua, the 24th chapter and verse 32 is the book that we're looking at. 
But in that particular chapter, the people said, uh, said unto Joshua, Jehovah our God, we will serve him, and his voice and so forth will, will take place in verse 32. The bones of Joseph, those are Joseph's bones, and Joshua 24, 32. And the bones of jo Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, they buried them in Shechem, in the parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamar and the father of Shechem for a hundred pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. Joseph did this by faith. It's a matter of faith. What can be a matter of faith of caring about your bones? In the context of Hebrews 11 and verse 22, he told those that would be living, those who would be coming out of Egyptian bondage, you begin to see that part is, is emphasized in his faith. They're going to be delivered from Egypt. And he had faith and trust in God that indeed those things would take place. But we see here that it was by faith he wanted his bones to be carried and buried in that land of Canaan that they came to. He cared about his bones. That's kind of the last thing that's left of your identity. The flesh is gone. It's just your bones. But it was important to Joseph. And the idea of not a bone being broken is also important. In Exodus, the 12th chapter, verse 46, when the Passover lamb was eaten, they were to eat that. And they were to never break one bone of that Passover lamb. As they were to eat it on that occasion, but no bone shall be broken. And when Jesus was crucified, who is that Passover lamb in the Corinthian letter? The Bible says it fulfills scripture that not a bone of his would be broken. In a context that when they came to see if the people had died, those who were crucified with Jesus, those bad men, Jesus is crucified along with them as a bad man, deserving of death of this kind. They didn't break Jesus' bones because he's already dead. They broke the other bones of those crucified. And that Passover lamb, it was Jesus Christ who, who died for our sins. Bones are very important in Scripture. And it's very important with David that in this particular context of suffering, of how we should look at our life and in a context of deliverance because there's one more passage in Ezekiel in Ezekiel's day where it was to be given him to have to give encouragement to the people of God that have been in captivity and Ezekiel was brought by God to a valley of many bones many bones Ezekiel 37 and verse 2. They were very dry in verse 5. Dry bones. That's the end of you. There's no marrow left. There's nothing left of you. There's discouragement. There, you've ended. And that would be the picture of that. But what happens? God says, I'm going to put some sinews on those bones I'm going to put some flesh on those bones. Ezekiel, you breathe life unto those bones, and they're going to stand up, and they're going to be a great army of God. They're not defeated by death. Not a bone is broken. And maybe they have put you in a situation where all your bones are broken before they put you to death for being a Christian. That's not the point. The point is that when they, you think, that's the end of me and there's no more hope. You got deliverance from God. 
I think he's pointing to the resurrection. That if we ever deteriorate to our bones and they begin to crumble, what have the people, not one bone is broken. And that's the part of deliverance. Deliverance from what? Death. I want to know how I'm going to face death. Is that your fear? All of your fears, he'll deliver you. He'll help you get through that. You just be godly. You be gracious. You, you be good. You be seeking that which is good. In times of persecution, even if it means the trouble in your death, you don't let that overcome you. Because I realize that God, even in this state, no bone will be broken because you will deliver me from death. Now, she began to have an insight of where David wanted us to see, where Peter wants us to see, where we need to see. And sometimes we don't look that far. We're a little upset with God because he hadn't taken care of it in five years. He hadn't taken care of it in ten years. When is it going to end, God? A little time, a little while, and we wait. But we wait in this proper frame of mind. And I think the idea of the bones not being broken, that very much deals with Jesus. He was our sacrifice, and through him, we have life. We'll have life beyond the grave, and we look forward to that. So, if we're preparing for times of suffering, I'll leave you three areas of thought. We'll praise God at all times. What time you're not? When you're persecuted? When you're about to die? When you're sick and you have chronic illness? And there's no more hope for you? And you're in a hospital room and you're, you're, you're feeling sorry for yourself? No, I will praise God at all times and I will continually praise Him out of my mouth. Notice continually at all times. What time is there? David, when you were scared of Saul? Yeah. Peter, when people were ostracizing us and speaking evil of us? Yeah. When we're called Bible thumpers and Deplorable people and not loving people because he stand up for righteousness those times. Yes When I have to suffer cancer and die yes Well, when did I get delivered of that we had your funeral He delivered you and not a bone of yours will be broken And when that is in your mind you'll realize he opens this psalm with continual praise to God because there's not a thing that ought to keep you from worshiping God. You may not be able to get out, but you can worship God at all times because I know what it means to suffer and I know what it means to be delivered and God will do that. Secondly, our suffering is designed to prove us. It is to test us. It is to refine us for what really is important in life. That you can take on anything that comes your way. A hurricane, a disease, old age, losing your job. In times of adversity, consider. In times of prosperity, rejoice. I can praise God at all times. I can consider, how should I react to this? I'm not going to blame God. I'm going to realize God brought it on. This is part of his refining process for us to be prepared for heaven. And we get caught up into this world and everything ought to work right toward our thinking. And we prepare ourselves that things will be in place for us. And, and then something happens that disrupts that. It's there to test us. That's what it is. And all the while, he's good. He's good. And I'm going to learn, lesson God, just help me. 
and I'll be back to service this Sunday, and I'll be back Wednesday. I will be back when it's time to praise you, and I'll praise you in my hospital bed. I'll praise you in my nursing home. I will praise you wherever I might be. Because, God, I look ahead and realize not a bone will be broken of me before you. Romans 5, verse 1 and 4. Do you see the proving process that causes you to be able to rejoice in sufferings? Paul does. Being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, but you might not have peace with mankind around you. I got peace with God. Through whom also we've had our access by faith in this grace wherein we stand. I stand in the grace of God, and I think people ought to like me now. Maybe not. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. When is that going to be? Heaven. That's our hope. And not only so, but we also rejoice in our tribulation. Did you hear that? We rejoice in our tribulations. No, we rejoice because we're delivered from our tribulations. We know we will be. It may be this tribulation is my death. Paul knew it's coming. But see, this is the mindset. I can rejoice in my tribulations. Why? Because it refines me for the present. Knowing that the tribulation work is steadfastest, I'm going to be stronger. I got a, a different outlook of how I need to look at things from, the, from God's perspective. And steadfastness is a provenness, or sometimes character, because we have the right character as all those lines up. I'm meek and I'm, I'm, I'm just with God, I'm righteous, I fear God. I got all those things in order there, and that will approve. That's how God, we're, we're proven to be those type of people, that type of people. A provenness or a character, steadfast is a provenness, and a provenness brings forth hope. And hope putteth not to shame. Not a bone will be broken. I will bring life to your bones. And what this is, is a test, God. I know that. I can rejoice in it, even though it's difficult to do it. But I'm going to continue to praise you with my lips, and I will do that at all times, even this time. And you fill the blank. Even this time. Where I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. You can make it. Because you're preparing yourself for those times of adversity. And I will be delivered from all of my afflictions. What happens in the end in Psalm 34? All the people who blasphemed your name, all the people who tell, tell lies about you, some you don't even know about that's hurt your reputation as a Christian. Does that make you curl up in a fetal position and say, I just don't take, take it anymore? No. And I don't have to fight that battle. I don't have to go around and say, what are they saying about me? What are they saying about you? But I know it exists. I know that we have enemies. And I know that God sees that. He'll take care of it. Evil shall slay the wicked. Evil shall slay the wicked. That evil heart that says lies and, and wants to cause that kind of harm. God sees that. It will slay the wicked. And they that hate the righteous shall be condemned. When God... <laughs> Seem like the righteous get by with everything. Unrighteous get by with everything. And we're the ones that are condemned. He'll take care of that in judgment. Jehovah redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that take refuge of him shall be condemned. They're not going to be condemned. What does Paul say in Romans 8 and verse 33 and verse 34? There's not a thing that can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ... The love of Christ that's in that's the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And we read in Romans 8, 33 and 34, where he asks this, this question and brings forth this point. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is this that condemneth? And in reality, 
they're no power. Well, they got me fired. They, they hurt my, my job. They hurt my relationship with others on the job. They took away my livelihood. I don't fear their fear. We'll find another job. We'll just keep doing good. But God is the one we need to be right with. And at the end, we will not stand condemned. In verse 37, Nay, and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. I'm persuaded neither death nor life. That covers it, doesn't it? Death nor life. Anything that happens in life, even the enemy that we fear the most, death. We don't have to do that in Christ. And the way David said it, not a bone is going to be broken. By faith we know life is going to be given to those bones. We'll be raised from the dead. And it's through Christ that he was that Passover hymn. Deemed us from our sins, but he redeemed us from death. Life or death. Verse 39, or height or death or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Don't let sickness, adversity, don't let death separate you from God because it can't do that when we're prepared for those days of suffering. And I think when we have that mindset, we can look at Scripture in a lot of ways because we're preparing our life in light of eternity, not our days upon this earth where everything's supposed to work out fine. That's not guaranteed to us. And if we live godly, we will suffer persecution. But we will realize in the broad picture, I can be still doing good. I'm not going to render evil for evil. I'm going to be doing what I need to do. I'm going to continually praise God and praise Him for delivering me. And I may be going through the hardest torture for being a Christian. But it'll be just for a little while. And when I'm in the grave and my bones are the only thing left, I know they'll be raised one day. There's going to be life given to death. And then I'll realize, what could man do to me? And those days of suffering were not wasted in feeling sorry for ourselves. We're not wasted in not doing anything for the Lord. Those days were filled with doing good and tasting that God is good and doing what we can to glorify Him in all of our days. That's going to happen. And David wanted us to see that. Peter wanted his brethren to see that. I want our brethren to see that. I want our young people to see that. That I don't know what lies ahead, but it could be very difficult for the Christian. And we're now prepared for suffering with a positive attitude about life. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you to be one because that's how we conquer death. We die, but we realize that's not the end of us. We realize that we have a hope that is sure in heaven if we remain faithful unto God, because in Christ Jesus, he's the resurrection and he is the life. And you'll never regret serving him, even if it means persecution or what trouble it comes in your life. You can take it on with the faith that you have in Christ Jesus. Why not start and say, I want to become a Christian. I want to repent of my sins and be baptized in the mission of sins. I want to confess that Jesus, that Passover lamb that died to take away my sins and to redeem me from death and the grave. He is the son of God and I'll make that confession and I'll start living the life of a Christian. We encourage you, be baptized tonight, obey the Lord. If you've fallen away from the Lord, come back to him. He's gracious and loving. You can start anew. But let's get started with a perspective that God gives the people who fear him, who are righteous before him and have the hope of eternity with him, even beyond the grave. Come as we stand and as we sing.